Hi everyone, a quick note before we launch into today's video. We are extending the application window for CADA 3 of our IPSA professional training course until early July of this year, due to the high level of interest that we've received. If you are interested in becoming a therapist by training in Stephen Pauline's psychosystems analysis model of depth psychology and under their direct tuition, then check out the course website link in the description. Thanks. Hi everyone. The nature of one's own sexual libido is often a captivating topic for many people, regardless of whether this engagement is positively or negatively valenced in terms of feeling. Indeed, the canon of depth psychology has often turned its gaze onto the study of sexual relating, with many different ideas and theories resulting. On this, we recently received a question from a member of our Discord server, which goes as such. How can someone with a sexual fetish towards STDs be explained? I recently discovered that there are people with fetishes for catching STDs. One person wrote that they feel important and that they've been especially chosen to die from catching an STD. I'm thinking Thanatos is at play. I also notice the contrast or irony of finding death in the one action that creates life. It feels oddly, negatively alchemical, and as if something in that person's psyche is playing out in this way. In response, the co-founder of the Institute for Psychosystems Analysis and my professional mentor, Steve Richards, a depth psychologist with over 40 years of clinical experience and a personal family friend of Carl Jung's only son, Franz Jung, responded with the practical theory that can be expanded to aid in the study of any so-called sexual fetish, as such, using the above example of a so-called fetish around STDs as the example. It reads as such. Firstly, shift your perspective away from the ego, and more specifically, your ego. Now, in the thought experiment, adopt the perspective of your genome. That's a Paleolithic perspective, at the very least. Most likely, much, much older. But it is a start. The prime imperative is to survive, survive in order to mate. And to do both of these, it's good to relate. So your anima, which is your relating function, is active immediately from birth. If you don't relate, you die long before you can mate. There is no Jungian shadow, as you have as yet no psychological ego to cast such a shadow. You have a preformed capacity to form an alter ego, as a homeostatic regulator of your best adaptations for survival. But you have no Jungian psychology, only the genome, its drives, and that which delivers those drives in the form of libido, i.e. your instincts. The environment is hostile. Any adaptive advantage, even if it's suboptimal, will be attempted. Consciousness formed long ago, in your remote non-human ancestors. It is fundamentally affect or emotion. Both consciousness and affect are subcortical, that is, independent of the cerebrum and its hemispheres. You've developed an enlarged cerebral cortex, particularly association cortex, in both hemispheres, to allow plasticity in response to the environment against the press of instincts, that is, instinctive pressure. This is the origin of the concepts of the Freudian id and ego. The association cortex, along with its subcortical connections, is the realm of complexes, Jung. 
Instincts push and even compete on an evolutionary best guess hypothesis against intended outcome from within the genome. The genome over lifespan development, timed release, expresses the overall innate plan for development and adaptation. This results in many cases in the seedbed of neurosis. At the heart of every neurosis are one or more instincts that have been frustrated, repressed or otherwise denied. These competing drives summate in some apparently peculiar outcomes, which is why it is necessary to run the thought experiment from outside of the reflexive comfort zone of the ego. I know of clinical case studies where an individual man has accepted his wife's infidelity because it enhances his status that other men would want her, even though she treats him with contempt and he knows it. He'll still accept the trade-off that allows one instinct to counter another, albeit that he is simultaneously reduced in status by her behaviour. It is irrational if you think only in narrow terms. There is a calculation involved that sums as his acceptance. You could work out potential anticipations from the genome, but they include the belief that he has attracted a popular woman, then other women will want him, because his popular wife has him. Ergo, he has status, and that must mean that he has good genes. Now to the STD fantasies. If you can be exposed to infection and survive, you've proven your biological, and in this case, reproductive, fitness. You've shown that you can compete with other men, for women popular enough to have caught STDs. It apparently enhances your competitive status. It also bonds you with a peer group of men who have similar predilections. You're one of them. These ideas have the dual advantage of competing for reproduction and peer group bonding. Of course, in present day society, things seem superficially different, but the same instincts arise and are deployed against the confusing boundaries of relating that the reproductive age men of today encounter. Loss of status or fear of the same, including not reproducing and having no male hierarchical status, constellate instincts in response, which then collide with the ego and produce compensating fantasies. To the extent that a man is conscious of this, the fantasies are as harmless as any pawn, which is fundamentally a redirection of libido, symbolically, until it can be completed, purposefully in relating. To the extent that a man is unconscious, his ego, in effect, then becomes a fiction that is created by instinctive pressure. A fiction in the sense that it has lost its executive adaptive role in the outer world, as is a relatively empty structure comprised of instinct-directed fantasies. Alternatively, there is the homeostatic need for degradation. An ego that is too unconscious of itself, but occupied itself with its own self-generated fictions, or perhaps inflated by the projections of others, or of the role they occupy in a society, may find that instincts regulate his inflation through pressure to dial down his status. If a man stands too proud and perfect, nature may well target him for competitive pruning by a rival. Better then to be self-regulated against the trend of self-importance from within than to be taken out terminally from without. Always ask, what are the instincts up to? What do they want? Under the prime directive of the genome, the instincts will create any potential survival and reproductive option that can be expressed. This is why a conscious relationship to instinct is the only way to avoid them making a decision for us. The act of building that connection dials down the instinctive pressure to complete any suboptimal outcome. Your instincts will instead align behind the clarity of adaptation that the ego holds and communicates so that the pressure reduces and you feel better. Remember, archetypes are not so much the self-portrait of instincts, as Jung said, as the fantasies of instincts. They are, in effect, fictions, commissioned for the distraction of the ego away from maladaptation and intercongruence with the genome. When we fail to understand this, we lose our way and once more become the mere fiction of the instincts ourselves. The instincts are the emissary of their master, the genome. 
They deliver the intentionality of the genome beyond the immediate biological frame of the individual organism, out into adaptation in the world. Archetypes, so called, are the dynamic embedded narrative of the genome, drawn by the active hand of instinct. Archetypes are NPCs without affect and instinct. They have no real context or meaning, otherwise. This is why they, archetypes, are of secondary importance, even no importance, in real depth psychotherapy. Mark Solms and Yak Pangsep have demonstrated that affect is conscious and a priori to so-called cognitive consciousness. Most of the ego is unconscious too. It's a field of relative consciousness with a nodal point of limited immediacy, surrounded by accessible associations that fade away with relative distance from this nodal point, and or with a reducing energetic quotient of reflexive attention. The self-concept and persona are wider components of the ego, with the former being by far the larger and internally definitive regarding continuity of reflexive identity. The post that you've just heard read out is, thus, an explanation as to why it is essential to shift, with any perceived maladaptation, away from the current ego position, and instead adopt the perspective of instinct and its prime orchestrator, the genome. The core question then, what is the intentionality of my current adaptation? Thanks everyone, we hope you found this video useful. If you'd like to read more posts like this, which Steve writes up more or less every single day, then you can join our Discord through the Patreon link in the description. Take care, and I'll speak with you again soon. If you're looking to take your study of depth psychology and personal development to the next level, using Steve and Pauline's 40-year-long clinical experience as your personal guide, then make sure you check out Young to Live By's flagship offering, Discover Your Personal Myth ultimate handbook. For anyone who has a calling deep in their very genome to become who they truly feel they should be, this guide is utterly indispensable. Pick up your copy today and make 2021 the year you truly begin to become yourself.